Ready? All right. Good. Uh, let me get some water. Okay, so why don't we move to um, John Simmons' reply to Waldron? Why is it a reply? Well, because Simmons, like me, uh, presumably like more the third kind of uh, foundation than the fourth. Um, and uh, John Simmons was uh, my colleague at Boston University. We were doing graduate studies together. Um, and uh, already back then he was studying uh, natural light, natural right law, and uh, um, so he, I, I can see where it comes from uh, in this debate. Um, and we are similar. Um, in fact, the first thing he does is to distinguish two both familiar and traditional ways of conceiving of the foundation, which are not. Uh, identical, but they both uh, belong to orthodoxy. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, derivation of human rights from human dignity, which is the way I uh, I go. The other one is the derivation of human rights not from dignity, but from uh, uh, the so-called inalienable and equal rights of men which is uh, a more direct reference to natural rights. Um, so the second one is the avenue that he uh, takes and that he kind of introduces in its bare essentials toward the end, uh, the third part of his paper. So um, the first thing he does being this uh, reply to Waldrum, not uh, accidentally and not surprisingly is a reconstruction of Waldrum argument and we can be relatively quick here because we have already seen how uh, Waldrum proceeds but there are certain things that Simmons points out that I think are very interesting and that should be highlighted so first that's a question I already got from one of the students he uh, notices that uh, on the one hand Waldrum doesn't say anything in his paper to the effect that the third kind of foundation is wrong or misled. He simply distinguishes it from the, his preferred one. Um, now the other, on the one hand he does that, on the other hand he notices a difference between the third and the fourth kind of foundation that Waldrum left implicit. Um, the third foundation is uh, appropriate, is uh, useful if you want to criticize the existing list of human rights. Why? Well, precisely in the way in which uh, I exemplified before with the notion of a uh, holiday with pay, the human right to the holiday with pay, um, he um, notices that um, by adopting the third um, model of a foundation, um, one is, a, uh, is in the position to argue in favor of uh, having less human rights or more human rights compared to the ones that are already present in the official document. So if you think that something is missing in the human rights that we already have for a full and effective protection of human dignity, you should add new human rights. If you think that some of the human rights there uh, are too loosely related to human dignity, you want to take out these rights from the list, from the official list. With the fourth count of foundation, this uh, becomes a little bit more difficult to do, and that's the kind of uh, consequence of the legalistic approach, if you want, that uh, Waldrum has. You know, there is this famous distinction that Kant makes in the Metaphysics of Morals at the beginning of the Metaphysics of Morals. Right law, in general, can be addressed from two very different perspectives. One is the perspective of the jurisprudence. They study 
the law that already exists and they make all the nice analysis uh, and connection that uh, one can make between bodies of parts of this uh, uh, body of law that are uh, already present and the other perspective, the one that Kant likes, that in general is the most more philosophical one, is a critical perspective on the law that already exists. Uh, in order to do that, obviously, you need to have different sources. Uh, in my opinion, the sources that Kant uses are the, the moral law and the ethical um, results that he had already reached in uh, the critique of practical reasoning, in the groundwork, and so on and so forth. There is a body of normative prescription that or, are already available to him, Kant, and on the basis of which he has a critical stance from which uh, it's possible to criticize the, the law uh, as a, an accurate or inaccurate embodiment of this moral um, mo normative prescription that we have already secured um, elsewhere and through um, arguments that have nothing to do with the existing body of law. And something like that is happening also here because uh, Simmons thinks that uh, with this fourth model we never get out of the existing uh, normative prescriptions that we already have. I don't know whether this is entirely true because I think that what Waldron wants from his fourth model of foundation is also having this critical uh, ability. Um, in fact, um, I think that uh, it is, on the one hand it is true that he says we start from the existing human rights and we, tr and we look for a possible unifying, organizing idea that uh, makes them a unified body. Uh, on the other hand, he also thinks, although it's not very explicit about it, that once we have found this unifying, organizing idea, we can go back uh, where we started from, so to human rights as they are already listed, and see whether we want to make some change. So, uh, I don't know whether Simmons is entirely correct in uh, attributing this uh, static non-critical uh, feature to the fourth model that Waldron prefers. But he um, makes this distinction be between the third and fourth model. Um, and he thinks that if you conceive of dignity as a status concept, as Waldron does, and not as a value concept, uh, then uh, um, it becomes more difficult to keep this critical attitude becomes more difficult to do this, uh, to take this distance that allows you to say, ah, okay, maybe there is an inflation of human rights, maybe we have to take out some of these rights, maybe we have to add rights that have, were not uh, included originally, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me just mm, um, point to a characterization of dignity uh, uh, by Waldron as a portmanteau description. Uh, portmanteau is sort of um, jacket uh, or no, a sort of bag actually. Um, so the thing that allows you to bring your clothes when you travel, so a bag, a baggage. Um, he thinks that dignity is something like a bag. Uh, that uh, includes um, rights that are unified by this bag, uh, human dignity, uh, and which uh, could also be conceived as having a lower unifying principle. So, uh, it's too bad I don't have, oh yeah, I do have, so. Um, According to Waldron, basically, dignity is this organizing idea, um, and uh, um, 
you can conceive of it as the bag that includes all the human rights. Uh, so you bring it with it. Um, but within this bag, there could be subgroups of rights which are unified by lower principles. So for example, here you can have civic and political rights. Here you can have social and economic rights. Uh, I remind you that despite this notion of first generation, second generation, third generation of rights, it is incorrect to believe that social economic rights were a late addition to human rights because already in the Universal Declaration you have a strong commitment to not only civic and political rights but also social economic ones. So, I mean, besides, uh, so here you can have uh, fair trial uh, rights, um, protections uh, against degrading punishment. Uh, so, uh, this idea of dignity as a status concept, uh, as a poor man tool, that is as a bag, is something that goes along these lines. D dignity should unifies all of them, but within the, the whole body of human rights, you do have lower uh, principle that organize a set of human rights among themselves. Um, now, at this point, um, Simmons asks basically uh, two questions. Um, what status are we uh, assuming by saying that dignity is this kind of status? That's the first question he asks. Let me see if I can find uh, the passage. One forty three. Okay. Here, so suppose for a moment that human dignity is in fact best understood as a special status enjoyed by all humans, that com the democratization, that comprises a particular list of human rights along with that list guiding rational. Two further questions seem appropriate. Okay, let's concede it's a status. First, exactly what kind of status for humans is being asserted in putting forward this list of human rights along with human dignity as that least guiding rational? Question number one. Question number two. Is there any good reason to think that of that list of rights as fixed or given? Because as I was telling at the beginning, of, before the break, that's the way in which Waldron operates. I mean, human rights are given. I mean, that's the political orientation that Waldron has, right? Human rights have not to be invented, already exist. We have to start from there and then make our philosophical analysis. It's not that we start from some philosophical concept and then we start criticizing the practice. But at the same time, Simon says, um, why should we conceive of uh, this list of rights as fixed or given? Now, the first question is answered by in the Turner lecture according to Simmons. Um, so this idea of the highest possible status. So a possible answer Patricia's question before. You know, you, we can all we can all be kings, right? <laughs> but we can all be equal citizens. So there are certain privileges that cannot be democratized out of logical reasons, but others can. Um, so, um, on the one hand, this idea of the highest possible status, uh, which democratizes the status assigned to nobility in, uh, in the medieval um, time. Um, now, Simmons is not so much convinced that the status human rights uh, attribute to each every, uh, and every human being is the one uh, of having a high rank 
uh, or uh, is, a, is best understood in terms of the study that was once attributed to nobility, uh, but that's not a very important um, point of his argument. Now, the second question is more important. Even granting Waldron his associations between dignity and noble rank, however, is there good reason to suppose that the list of human rights in which that rank partly consists is, uh, consist is more or less fixed, rest, resting expansion or uh, diminution? It is hard to see why we should be persuaded of this, and here comes the crucial point. At least we follow Waldron in viewing the status of human rights holder as including that position's guiding principle, as including the ideas that give the list of human rights that unity and point. Acknowledging that a list of rights is not a mere plurality, so it's not you know, a, a list of things that have no relations with one another, may not logically commit one to any position on the subject of whether that justifying point can require or permit the inclusion on that list of additionally, originally neglected or ignored or never thought of items. But such an acknowledgement surely at least suggests that view. Other kinds of lists along with their unifying rationales surely call for or permit such expansion as, a, as when I simply remember or discover another thing that needs to be purchased or done and so needs to be added to my list. Only, so this is the point I wanted to highlight, only I think if we suppose that the status of human dignity is not a general normative status at all, but only a legal one, would we in, be inclined to suppose that the least justifiably resist expansion? And only when then if we think of legal status in an especially narrow and implausible way. So what Simons is saying here is that Waldron's idea that the list is closed, fixed, given, not to be changed, not to be expanded or uh, diminished, is plausible only if we conceive of the status not uh, in a normative uh, sense, but in a legalistic one. What does that mean? Well, uh, it means that um, you, in the same way in which you do not try to add a new law in the body of laws of a nation, simply because you have found that all the laws of the country turn around one or, or more uh, organizing concept that could be freedom or uh, happiness or what have you. I mean, imagine a legal scholar that uh, comes to the university and says, oh, I have discovered that uh, all our laws in these countries relate to these two organizing concepts that could be freedom and happiness. If that is the case, I think that we have forgotten about certain laws that need to be introduced in this body of laws because otherwise happiness and freedom are not secured. So I'm making the case for introducing a new law. That's not the way in which a legal scholar talks because he knows that the production of new, new law cannot be generated by you know, uh, uh, an intellectual um, achievement in which we realize that uh, the people has forgotten about laws that should be introduced in order to uh, better serve those overarching principles. So that would be the legalistic approach that pushes Waldron towards conceiving of the list of human rights as given, as prefixed, as immutable, as resistant expansion. 
But if you think of that status, remember we are conceding Waldron that human dignity is a status, but if you conceive of that status in a normative sense, that is perhaps not as a value, but as something that uh, is not merely an organizing principle, it's something that has normative priority over the specific items that are supposed to realize that uh, prescriptive normative status, then there is no reason to think that we cannot expand or subtract the list of specific rights of which that is a organizing principle. So, um, not only Simmons argues is this implausible if we uh, conceive of this status not in a legal, in a legalistic way, but it is also implausible because even if we conceive it in a legalistic way, uh, uh, it could be the case that by um, having a, a broader understanding of this uh, legal status, we could be uh, encouraged in making these subtraction or additions to the specific items that we have. So other kinds of legal status grow and evolve as social facts change or become clear, or as prejudices narrow or dissolve. I mean, imagine the commitment of the American Constitution, the Bill of Rights, to the equality of human beings. Of course, the equality of human beings in the 18th century in the United States meant one thing, the equality of white human beings. But the equality of human beings after the civil crime movements meant something different, the equality of human beings in general. Um, I mean, of, at least of uh, American citizens. So, um, I think that what Simmons is saying here is that basically, even if you understand the status not in a normative sense, but in a legalistic one, um, there is no good reason to believe that as Waldron argues, that the list of which that is an organizing principle cannot be expanded or reduced uh, to better serve the organizing principle itself. Yes? Right. Well, I guess that the difference uh, is this. Uh, Conceiving of human dignity in a legalistic manner, as a you know, uh, as a status, um, is the idea that um, human dignity does not add anything to the normative force that is already included in the specific pieces of legislation of which human dignity is the organizing principle. So it's just a short name, an organizing uh, idea for the real things that really matter, which are the existing laws. Those are the ones that we start from and we do not want to change because uh, they already have a normativity that is produced by the fact that they were decided by the people, they were passed by a parliament, whatever origin of the normativity of these specific laws. Uh, so you, the legalistic uh, understanding of this status is just, you know, it's an organizing idea. Uh, it's a way of understanding better the body of laws uh, you are talking about. So if you want to compare the body of laws of Western liberal democracies to the body of laws uh, uh, of so the Soviet Union, just to give you the most uh, evident example, you might say the organizing idea behind the first one is freedom, the other one is um, well-being. I mean, it's very, very crude, but 
um, um, you get the idea. So you make this legal analysis and you say, okay, the organizing principle uh, behind uh, the body of laws in Western liberal democracies is freedom. The organizing principle behind the body of laws of <coughs> communist countries is the well-being uh, of, uh, of, of the people or the lack of uh, uh, oppression or what have you. Um, The normative understanding of a status is different in that it says, okay, uh, if freedom is the organizing principle of uh, the body of laws of Western democracies, then um, there are certain normative um, desiderata that should be realized through part of the legislation that has been, that is not yet in force, that should be introduced. So the normative work is done by the guiding principle, that is not just, you know, a short name for the normativity that you already find at the lower level. It's rather something that has normative force in itself and that waits to be translated in possibly new pieces of legislation that have to be introduced in the, at the lower level, okay? So, um, of course, Simmons thinks that the relation between human dignity, I mean, whatever moral higher ground we have above uh, human rights and human rights themselves has to be conceived not in this legalistic manner. So if a proper understanding of the status of human dignity might itself license derivations of additional human rights for our list, however, then there is no obvious inconsistency involved in both accepting Waldron's very plausible analysis of human dignity and at the same time pursuing fundamental foundational projects of Waldron's third sort, the logical derivation such as briefings. So that's the point Simmons is getting at. He doesn't like a theory that does not allow you to have this critical distance from existing human rights. He wants to have a theory that puts you in the position to uh, subtract, add, uh, reconceive, reinterpret the existing human rights. Um, if that is possible, uh, and there are no principled reasons for not doing so, Simmons continues, then uh, we discover uh, that, as we were saying in the first part of the class, that the third and the fourth model of the foundations are not incompatible with one another. They, are, they could actually go together. And in a sense, he uh, suggests that not only they are incompatible, they are not incompatible, but they could be mutually supportive. How? Well, um, you may um, do the kind of analysis that Waldron likes by conceiving of human dignity as this idea that sheds indispensable light on the numerous dispersed, diverse human rights that we have in the list. Um, and uh, show therefore that this is not a, an erratic and a non systematic list, but that they hang together in a coherent whole precisely because they all relate to this organizing idea of human dignity, and that would be the fourth model. But at the same time, you may have more in the mood of the third model of a foundation, you may have uh, some reforms in the existing human rights so that you add or subtract some of them to have a better fit between the, the organizing principle and the, the things that should be organized by that principle. So 
in this way you derive from human dignity certain prescriptions, certain normative conclusions that allow you to have a better fit than the one you started from between the lower level and the higher level. And in fact, I think that what Simos is suggesting, this is exactly what you should do when we decided that let's assume that we decided that, that we assume that then we when we decided that holiday with pay should not longer <coughs> be part of the list of human rights, what we are doing is to derive the subtraction of uh, holiday with pay from the list of human rights for the sake of a better fit between the higher level in which you f we find the organizing principle and the lower level in which we have human rights. The conclusion is that human dignity in both cases is the organizing principle of this body of uh, laws, let, let's say that they are laws. Um, so this is how the two models are not in conflict with one another but they could be mutually supported. So, if you make a reform of the existing list of human rights that allow you to have a better fit between the idea of human dignity and human rights themselves, you are not going against the fourth kind of foundation that Waldron suggests. You are actually going you know, pretty much in the same direction because even more dignity will be the organizing principle of human rights after the reform. I don't know if, I'm, if I made myself clear. They could be mutually supportive because they both say that human dignity is the central, pivotal concept of human rights, but instead of being in alternative with one another, one reinforces the other. The third reinforces the fourth by introducing a reform that allows you to have a better fit between the guiding principle and the bodies of law. The fourth reinforces the third because it's, it shows you analytically, so to speak, that human dignity is precisely that organizing principle that makes sense of all the human rights that you have. So, why, I mean, why is Simmons making these points? Well, obviously to make room for the legitimacy of the third kind of foundation because that's, that's the one he wants to practice most. In fact, he says, my own view is that a full defense of the importance of human rights does indeed require deep foundations, not just something foundationish. And as we saw at the start, we might look for such deep foundations, not only in possible conceptual connections between human dignity and human rights, but also in the historical connections between human rights theory and natural rights theory. Okay, don't get confused here. When he says we could also use historical connection between human rights theory and uh, uh, natural rights theory, he is not saying, oh, now I also want to introduce the first kind of foundation that we distinguish. Remember the genealogical, historical, uh, kind of foundation that Waldron um, talked about. No, he's not saying that. He's saying something different. He's saying, well, if the third kind of foundation is legitimate, let's assume that it is, then we might also argue that human rights are nothing but a subset of natural rights. Hmm? Let's make this further assumption. If that is the case, then it follows that if we have a good philosophical argument that shows that natural rights are grounded, that are valid, that it, they exist and they are not just an invention, then we have also a foundation of human rights because human rights are nothing but a subset of natural rights. So, since he likes natural rights, since Simmons likes natural rights, 
and as I was telling you, he begins his career as a philosopher as uh, through an historical analysis of Locke and other natural uh, rights theorists, it follows that uh, he wants to show that if you believe in natural rights, then you also are in a position to believe in human rights. So he's shifting the burden of the proof from human rights to natural rights on the assumption that one is just a subset of the other one. That human rights are just a subset of natural rights. Does okay. this dialogue a little bit with the second type of foundation, in the sense that um, if the natural rights are valid, then the human rights are also valid? Like with the second yes. um, foundation. Ah. Um, no, because the relationship between natural rights and human rights is, a, is one of content as well. Mm -hmm. That is, natural rights are a broader set of rights, according to Simmons, that establish that you have a right to property, that you have a right to physical security, that you have innate right to freedom, as Kant would say, and this kind of stuff. And uh, he argues that um, the normative space of natural rights is broader than the normative space of human rights. Okay? So, you already have in natural rights all the content that is included in human rights. I mean, you have to do some work because, of course, it's not enough to say that you have an innate right to freedom to move to uh, freedom of the press, to uh, right to a fair uh, trial, to right to association. I mean, there is work to be done, but the essential components of what you find in human rights are already included in natural rights. Okay? So in this case there is a, an analogy between the content of natural rights and the content of human rights. In the second kind of foundation that Waltram distinguishes, the one related to the Grunorm, Kelsen and so on and so forth, there is no relationship about the content of the different normative prescriptions. One just entitles the validity of the other one, not because they, are, they have similar content, but because it, it establishes the, the legitimacy of the procedure that created that lower level norm. So they could be talking about completely different things. The group norm only shows that the more specific lower level norm has been rightly generated, but validly generated, okay? So that's why I don't think it's, a, it's an instance of the second kind of foundation. Um, so, um, Let's explore a little bit these suggestions by Simmons that human rights could be simply a subset of natural rights. I mean, if that is the case, then uh, the foundation, as I said, then the foundation of human rights could be nothing but the foundation of natural rights. So that we shift the problem from the foundation of human rights under the assumption that they are just a subset of natural rights moves to the foundation of natural rights. If we ground natural rights, ipso facto, we have grounded human rights. Um, now, what is the most um, fantastic uh, uh, obstacle against the foundation of uh, natural rights? Uh, well, where are we? Let me find out. 
What would claiming that human rights are natural rights amount to? Suppose we define natural rights as those moral rights, one, that could be possessed by person in a state of nature, and b, whose grounds or justifications are not merely conventional. So that's the, the whole marks of natural rights. Natural rights cannot be conceived as merely conventional, of course. Uh, they exist even if there is no state, even if there is no one, you know, stipulation about that we have these rights. No, that's the famous uh, opposition uh, in which you can see, you can conceive of the law in general. You know, remember back in the, with ancient philosophy, the Sophists thought that laws are nothing but conventions, what the people decide, you know. Uh, there is no pre-existing limit to the will of the people. I mean, uh, and uh, anything that the people decides is the law, period. So that would be the merely conventional uh, understanding of the law. Uh, the alternative way of conceiving of it, which would be Plato's way, is that laws mirror some pre-existing normative uh, system that and it's up you know the question is whether the conventions the laws that we actually have are a good enough uh, expression of that pre-existing uh, normative body or not so this is the you know in this history of philosophy is a recurring um, alternative that you have in conceiving of, of the law either it's just a conventional point or is uh, the expression of uh, pre-existing normativity. Now, if you take the, not, the natural rights view, of course you are not with the conventional understanding of law, because they are natural rights precisely because they also exist in the state of nature. So even before the existence of the state, this natural right here is to live, you have some rights that are given to you by yeah, depending on the specific theory that you have. So in the before law coming with Rossius, Poof and Dorf, these guys ultimately is God that decides that you have these natural rights. It's the order of nature that assigns to you certain certain rights. No convention can uh, overthrow uh, and change this uh, objective order. Uh, Later on, you know, you have different um, foundation of this idea that you have pre-political, pre-state uh, entitlements, but the idea and the, the difference here do not matter. Um, if you side with natural rights, you believe that there are certain moral rights that you have independently of the state, independently of conventions, independently of whatever the will of the people decides, and so on and so forth. Hmm? So, human rights, if we understand them in the standard fashion as universal rights, that is, as rights necessarily possessed by all and only human beings, would then be those natural, non-conventional, moral rights that not only could be, but must be possessed by humans, not only in a state of nature, but in all other non-natural conditions as well. Human rights must be innate rights, that is, rights enjoyed from the moment that human life begins, and rights that cannot be lost by alienation or renunciation, by forfeiture, uh, through negligence or wrongdoing, or by prescription, either through governmental acts of prescription or through long passages of time without enforcement. Now, um, what is the point of this? Well, if we conceive human rights as natural rights, then we have to show how, in a certain sense, natural rights can be both universal and innate. Sorry, how human rights can be both universal and innate. Um, by universal here, 
we mean uh, not with universal validity that everybody agrees with this, but that they are attributed to each and every human being. Well, <coughs> Simmons goes on by saying, there is, I believe, a strong case that can be made for the view that, strictly speaking, there are no human rights so understood either because biological humans who lack even minimal cognitive and affective potential do not hold such rights, so that perhaps only human persons, not human beings, but, uh, but not all human beings or members of the human species possess human rights, or because no such rights are in principle inalienable or non forfeitable even if they may not routinely be either alienable or forfeitable. But it might well also be true that certain natural rights are nearly universal, that is, innately possessed by nearly all biological humans, and alienable or forfeitable only in extraordinary cases. And if that is true, then declarations of human rights and human rights conventions probably ought to describe and enforce the most basic moral rights of person as if they were truly universal human rights. So, what is, this, what, is what Simon saying? One up obstacle in conceiving human rights as natural rights is that we have to, remember the fidelity condition, we have to remain faithful to the idea that these rights are both universal and inalienable, because that's how human rights are usually conceived of. Now, Simmons replies, well, first of all, strictly speaking, if we really conceive as human rights as universal and inalienable, there are no human rights whatsoever. Why? Well, because he seems to take for granted that it's not the case that truly all human beings have human rights. Because there are, uh, I mean, think of people who were born without a brain, uh, or uh, people who um, um, have lost permanently um, their uh, rational capacities. Simmons, I think, is arguing for saying, well, it is rather straightforward that we do not concede all human rights even to this person. So uh, this universality has to be taken for, you know, with some caution. That's the point about the universality. The other point about the fact that uh, human rights are not inalienable, that cannot be uh, lost, is it again, uh, strictly speaking, false because there are human rights that can be lost um, by wrongdoing, by forfeiture, by um, uh, other uh, procedures. Uh, again, for example, I mean, you may have had all the human rights that are given to you by the official list, um, but if you become permanently mentally impaired, um, you no longer have the right to vote, for example. Uh, or um, you no longer have the right to decide for your life. I mean, if you are uh, judged by some judge uh, as unable to, uh, I, now I don't know the legalistic term, but um, if you are no longer um, considered by the society as uh, an autonomous person, uh, you are no longer free to do certain things, right? Um, like with old people that are conceived as, uh, what's the name in, in Italian? Is the patria potestata. Well, I mean, I, I think you understand when, yeah. when someone is so sick that he lost his mind, other people have the right to decide for this guy, and it's a judge who may, usually makes this decision on Tuesday, right? Now, I don't know how it, it's framed in. Uh, in the terms of your law, but I'm sure that there is something like that also in, in the Brazilian uh, legal system. So, 
this shows that it's not the case that human rights are inalienable, strictly speaking. I mean, there are certain human rights that you may lose depending on certain circumstances. There are extreme circumstances, but they exist. So, what's the point of, of being careful about universality and non-alienability? Uh, well, the point is that um, you cannot use the supposedly inalienability or non um, or universality of human rights as uh, an argument against the fact that you conceive of them as natural rights. Moreover, if there are natural moral rights, continues Simmons, that are both innate and cannot be lost, the likely candidates for inclusion in this category will make a familiar and a naturally unified list. People do terrible things to others, and in doing so, they forfeit rights that they would formerly possess. May they forfeit all rights by such acts, as Locke seemed to believe, suggesting that committing great enough wrongs reduces one to the moral status of a dangerous lower animal, perhaps as Locke might have been persuaded to concede, and as the US Bills of Rights suggest, a doer of terrible wrongs forfeits his right not to be killed, so permission for capital punishment, interrogation mark, maybe um, he forfeits this right not to be killed okay, on account of the wrongdoings that he, that he is responsible for, but not his right not to be tortured, his right not to be killed in degrading or humiliating ways, his right not to be hunted for sport or punished for the entertainment of others, and so on. Similarly, people are often thoughtless or imprudent in alienating their rights, for example, in losing needed funds or their return tickets while visiting a casino. So you get drunk at a casino, you lose, you lose, you lose all your money, you lose all your ticket to come back home. So you have lost, actually, your right, uh, the, the rights that you used to have. Many people thus alienate or risk alienating all of their moral rights. Well, evidently, we think that this is not the case, huh? simply because um, you, know, you were imprudent. Uh, it's not the case that you lose all your rights. And what rights you do not lose? Well, surely the best candidates for inalienability would again appear to be moral rights whose legal analog in the US law have that same property, such as the inalienable legal right not to be held as a slave, or perhaps the right not to be killed, or the right to the satisfaction of uh, our most basic needs. So even if you lose all your property because you were, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, losing all of it in playing the games at the casino, in playing, uh, you know, doing, uh, claiming, uh, and so on and so forth. It's not the case that you can be reduced a slave as a slave to repay your debts. Uh, so, what's the point of all this? The point is that when we try to decide which among the rights that we have enjoy this not absolute, not um, yeah, absolute inalienability and universality, Simmons argues, we not accidentally end up with what we usually conceive of as natural rights. And this is a great indication that the relationship between natural rights and human rights is very close. Because it, it would be extremely hard to conceive as a coincidence the fact that if in, lim in deciding which rights among the ones we have are, in, in, are universal, although not absolutely universal, and inalienable, although not absolutely inalienable, then we end up conceiving precisely the natural rights that come from the tradition.
In short, the natural rights that seem likeliest to qualify as universal human rights are precisely those rights, possession of which we might naturally say is necessary for living or dying with appropriate human dignity. So the best arguments for human rights foundation in natural right theory then seem bound to return us to that same idea of human dignity that is explored and analyzed by, as a status concept by Waldron. So whether we begin from the top with the list of legally established human rights or begin from the bottom, now the top here is the high level, the, the lower level, and the bottom is the higher level in, in the previous terminology, by thinking about those innate natural rights that seem least likely to be alienable or forfeitable, our arguments appear to converge on the same conclusions. So, if, as I've argued, there is no genuine inconsistency between Waldron's preferred approach and an approach starting from the foundation of natural rights theory, the two approaches may not be logically, not only be logically consistent, but mutually supportive. Okay, so that's the way in which Simmons tries to make room for the third kind of foundation and tries to show that by conceiving human rights as natural rights, we discover that not only as this, are these two foundations not incompatible, but they could even be mutually supported. So, Waldron is wrong in thinking that adopting the fourth kind of foundation excludes the possibility of having a good third kind uh, foundation. He proposes the, fo the foundation from natural rights as an example of the third kind of foundation and he tells us, look what a wonderful result we get. If we start from natural rights and we think of them as the moral foundation of human rights, we discover that human dignity is the overarching concept uh, that allows us to um, select the natural rights that we want to become human rights and therefore we end up with the same conclusion that Waldron had reached by making his conceptual analysis of the relationship between human dignity and human rights. And this shows that the two approaches reinforce one another instead of being in competition with one another. Now, of course, to say that things may be the way he suggests is not the same as saying that things are the way he suggests. That is, he still has to show that human rights have to be derived according to the third kind of foundation from natural rights. This is still an argument that it has not provided. He has made just a conceptual analysis to show that this could be a possibility. So let's try to see how he shows that actually natural rights are the moral foundation for human rights. And that's the last point uh, of today. Professor. Yes? Uh, for Simmons, the place of dignity would be more or less what the place of, uh, sorry, for Simmons the place of natural rights would be more or less the place of dignity for the orthodox approach. Absolutely, yes. Uh, whereas uh, the place of dignity for him would be exactly? Um, well, <coughs> in, my, in my foundation, you don't need to go through natural rights to arrive to human rights. You can start from human dignity and you move directly to human rights. Okay? In his opinion, uh, the starting point should be natural rights. This is the two orthodox foundation that 
symbols that he distinguishes at the beginning of his paper. Mm -hmm. He says there are two traditional ways of conceiving of the foundation. One is starting from human dignity, the other one starts from natural rights. I prefer the one, I, Simons, prefer the one that starts from natural rights and moves through human rights. Other people may do the, the alternative, yet still traditional uh, route of moving from human dignity to human rights. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that even if you start from natural rights, uh, human dignity doesn't play any role in your foundation. In fact, he thinks that human dignity is the concept that shows that when you derive human rights from natural rights, you do this derivation which is a kind of narrowing the scope of natural rights by having in mind human dignity. So, I don't know if I... So it is an organizing... Uh, yeah, it remains an organizing concept, also, also if you start from, from natural rights. So, Simmons says, I start from natural rights, and I think I can show you that human rights are derived from those, okay? How do I do this derivation? I do it because I, in the box of human rights, I place only the rights that connect somehow with the idea of human dignity. So this is a kind of selecting principle. For, yeah, I can feel it. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think that we can bypass the reference to natural rights and simply, you know, move from human dignity to human rights. That's the difference. <clears throat> and of course, Waldron says, human dignity is here, it's not higher. Okay? So they are at the same level. One is just the organizing principle of the other. Uh, that would be the fourth kind of foundation. <clears throat> 